And that's my cue for the morning. Good, uh, good morning, everybody, and welcome to the next in the series of the Rising Star Leadership Conversations. It's great to see you all here. It's great to see the chat. Thank you very much for welcoming and greeting everybody. We hope to hear a lot more of you during the course of the next 90 minutes. Um, thank you for supporting our leadership conversations. Um, this is a Rising Star initiative, um, and as many of you know, Rising Star is our program that recognizes the most talented young professionals across the whole of South Africa. We also give them a platform to connect and rise. I also see from the chat and know that we invited you. Thank you so many grad stars for turning up, attending, showing up and taking the opportunity to, le to learn. Um, this leadership conversations is not a new concept. We've been doing it over the past year. We've welcomed some amazing leaders. So many of you will know that one of the features of our conversation series is the give back offer from these top employers and top leaders. It's inspiring and amazing to see these busy people giving back to the next generation, donating their time, donating their expertise. So please remember um, that Taelo has kindly offered a 60-minute session of her time to one of you, to one of you in the audience that stands out, that brings your A-game, that asks relevant and informing questions. So seriously, it's not good enough just to turn up, show up, and make yourself known and take advantage of these amazing opportunities. Um, it is known that through her whole career, Taelo has, 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 has had a passion for developing people. She has a lot of experience and has invested time throughout her career in mentoring and coaching teams, young talent, in an effort to make a high performance and highly effective culture. So we're gonna be monitoring your questions. We'll go through all the questions after the event. Even if your question doesn't get asked, we may, you may still win. Um, so the winner will be announced early next week. And can you actually imagine spending 60 minutes in the company of this amazing lady? Imagine what you could ask her, what you could learn her experience, and when will you ever have this opportunity again? So here, let's wait for, so also we'll be announcing the winner on our Facebook page. So please use Rising Star SA, hashtag Rising Star 2021. Um, and we also welcome all the comments from this webinar to be posted. Another of my favorite features um, and what makes, what makes our Rising Star Leadership Conversations dif different from anything else out there is the opportunity that it gives us to feature some of our amazing Rising Stars. Who better to facilitate such a meaningful session all about celebrating the next generation of talent than one of our very own Rising Stars? Makes sense, right? So on this note, I would like to thank Guatemala, a rising star, a rising star and a rising talent in media. She was the winner of the 2018 Rising Star Award in the media and marketing sector. Guatemala, thank you for your time and thank you for your support and thank you for your participation. But, um, so going to the theme of leadership. Leadership, of course, is challenging at all times. All around every corner, there's a different challenge. But now, in the past 18 months, the time of COVID, no one could have prepared, planned or expected this. So this is when true lessons are learned and true icons are born. This, track, this isn't a path that's ever been trodden before. There is no blueprint. So we need to look up to our leaders and, and just learn. I mean, dealing with times, dealing leadership in a time of crisis. Wow, amazing people. So on this note, I'm completely honored um, to welcome Taelo Modapello whose name I hope I almost got right and didn't murder too badly. Um, she is a distinguished leader. She is the CEO of BP Southern Africa. And she's here today to give her perspective on leadership and learnings over the past 12 to 18 months and over her entire career. Daelo is a business leader with 18 years professional experience in Africa and a wealth of commercial and operational experience in supply chain, leadership, strategy and operational excellence. She, hold, she holds a Bachelor of Science honors degree in chemical technology from the University of Natal, a master's degree in environmental engineering from Cambridge University, as well as an MBA from Gibbs. This is an, she's an incredible lady. In addition, she's a certified supply chain professional, a certified director with the Institute of Directors, and a University of Vitt seasonal lecturer in modular supply chain. So don't miss your chance to learn from this incredibly incredible lady who has kindly donated her time. So ask away. Now on that note, that's me, that's my intro, that's my welcome, but this isn't my show. So Taylor and Guatemala, I'm gonna hand it over to you to conduct the interview and thank you and welcome. 
Laura, thank, thank you, you so much for that. Um, good morning to everyone. And Dayelo Mojabelo, welcome to the webinar about leadership conversation and also just highlighting aspects of mentorship. Welcome. Thank you. And I'm excited to be here today engaging our um, grad stars. Now, as Laura has said, I think this the Rising Star Awards have become such a great platform for upcoming young people in a different industry together from engineering to media like myself uh, and even hospitality. I'm pretty honored to be facilitating this with such an extraordinary woman in her own right. And being part of the Rising Star team doesn't just make you an award winner, but it also helps you connect with people such as yourself. Now, I'm not going to, you know, go too much into too many things. I'm going to get straight into it. And I do have to ask the first question is, what do you believe are the key attributes to becoming a leader and um, especially during a difficult time such as the pandemic? Thank you, Dumi. Um, I must say, I'll start with the pandemic. Mm. Um, I think the leadership script has often been uh, fairly well defined. We've been in a business as usual mode for a very long time. So at the onset of COVID, we obviously were faced with a challenge. There's no blueprint to some of the challenges that we've had to navigate. And the three, thi the three key things that um, were very apparent to me that needed to be um, dialed up and every leader needs to just make sure that um, they focus on those is not really about your technical competency, but the first yeah. one being listening skills. Um, we often tasked with communicating our expectations um, you know, the vision, the priorities, but also equally important are the listening skills. I always say the answer often lies in the room. And mm -hmm. if you, if you uh, practice the art of actually listening so that you understand and not just listening so that you, somebody can get their voice heard, mm -hmm. you will then start to realize that there's a lot of value in actually getting the collective opinion together. And I often sometimes have, uh, um, I, I reflect on a saying from Mark Twain, but I, I can't remember exactly what it says, but uh, it's more to the effect of, um, you know, wisdom is a reward for the lifetime of active listening, something to that effect. And, you know, you get a lot of wisdom from listening to other people. The second one for me, and probably most important, because that speaks to who I am and my values, is ethical practice mm. and a sense of community. So the decisions that you make should really speak to your values, should really hone in on ethics. Um, think about it, when we got into COVID, uh, if somebody is really focused on profit, you would have compromised the safety and health of your people. Mm. But if you, if you are focused more on ethical behavior, you'll understand that the most important asset is your people. And the, with the most important asset being your people, you'll do everything possible to ensure that you keep them protected. So that's just one example. The third yeah. one for me is humility. We all made mistakes during COVID, but if you practice the art of humility, you'll realize that the answer doesn't belong to you. And when people do well, you also give them credit, their due credit. Um, I'm certainly not a leader who believes in taking the credit alone. So you often see me in the background, but I want people to shine. And I have a particular interest in youth so give them the platform, let the ideas flourish and let them take the credit. And I think they are probably more open and you know, market themselves a lot better. So let them have that platform and let them actually develop and be the best. So that is who I am as a person. And for me, those three attributes, I think is what leaders should, have, um, should emulate as we are navigating this pandemic and as well as trying to get out of the pandemic into a you know, growth scenario for South Africa. Yeah, I love the part you mentioned about listening because often people think that because they are leaders, they lead and everyone needs to follow. They are following and listen to what they have to say. Not often do leaders actually say, you know what, let me hear what my junior has to say. Let me hear what even my assistant or receptionist has to say to build the company. So I really love 
that specific part of it. Um, I want to go back to Rising Star because I'm trying to get as many people as possible to enter for the next Rising Star Awards that might be taking place um, in the next year. One of the things that I took away from it was finding a good mentor and someone to lead me in and help me in the things that I do as a senior content producer. But Dialo, I want to know what role have other leaders played in you and your personal life and shaping your leadership skills and style? Okay, thanks for that. Um, just in my working career, to me, I've mm -hmm. had a lot of leaders who've shaped me. Um, most of them, I must say, being male, yeah. Um, and I probably only had one female leader. So the more we have them, you know, I think it would, things will change a bit in the coming years. But also different personalities. But the one leader who shaped me was in the year 2008, leading up to 2010. And uh, what this leader said to me was, you know what, um, you're not giving your best. But I was working very hard. And I thought I was working very hard. Mm -hmm. They said, yes, you're doing well. But... You know, I judge everybody by what I believe their abilities are. And I believe you're capable of much more. You're doing a lot in terms of doing well, but I don't think you're applying yourself to the best of your ability. Mm -hmm. And what happens at that point? You're, you know, fairly young, you're impressionable, and it, it, it gets to you. It, yeah. it almost demoralizes you. But in that sense, he was actually being positive by saying, you know, I know there's a lot more you can give. And your potential is much more than what you are actually putting on the table. So I obviously second guessed myself, and um, but realized I've got to correct it. And he said to me, "You you often have a tendency of letting louder voices win, and those louder voices may not necessarily be the correct one, correct ones." So obviously, you you know, you left disturbed. But I was fortunate in the sense that this leader actually recognized um, that I was. Um, you know, feeling quite demoralized about it and we spoke about it. And what I learned from that is we all have areas of development. And the one for me was how do I actually just not rely on my mental capabilities and my, my ability to work hard, but how do I also learn to start trusting my instincts more mm -hmm. um, and being a lot more assertive in how I communicate. But at the same time, because of who I am, I always have an inclusive approach and I was not prepared to give that to give that up. Um, so when you're operating in environments that are not very inclusive, mm. you, you sometimes feel alienated. And for me, that was a very big learning um, lesson of how to make sure that I educate a lot more people to be inclusive. And you know, now in the last few years, as I've had the platform to do so, one of my leadership ethos is to make sure that even the, the less, um, the, the voices that are not as loud in the room get an opportunity to be heard because I've made a conscious effort to choose a different path. So I must say he was actually quite influential and he's a male. Yeah. Um, and I'm hoping as a, as a female leader, I'll be a lot, a lot more influential to more people across uh, both genders and of different diversity um, yeah. to actually start emulating that behavior. I love that you, you want to grow and as, as a leader yourself, you're looking to grow others to become just as good as a leader as you are. Apart from the lesson you learned from that specific leader, what other lessons have become important to you as you grow as a leader, as you build your leadership uh, brand, so to say? Okay. Um, Dumi, I think sometimes we, you know, we, we get into the the, work, uh, the world of work, mm. because we've got degrees, we are qualified, and we start working. Mm -hmm. Then we get into the next role, and some people are fortunate enough to you know, be noticed, and they get promoted, and you know, move from one role to the others. Others probably float laterally for quite a long time. But the one thing I, I learned from my, you know, in my own journey is that you know, one needs to know their why. If you actually know, if you have a sense of purpose and you understand why you exist as a person, everything starts to fall in place. Because when you understand why you exist as a person, if you are thrown into an organization that does not have the same values as you do, mm. you will quickly know that you are actually not going to give your best because you're not going to flourish as an individual. 
Wow. So you need to find your niche where you're going to understand who you are as an individual and really understand why you do certain things. And also in the workplace, we as leaders, we sometimes have a tendency to tell people what to do and tell people how to do it. But we don't actually give them a reason to believe. So mm -hmm. as in, what is the why? Why am I doing certain things? So that for me has been the biggest thing. If you give people a sense of purpose and you let them understand why, everything starts to fall into place because the lack of the why actually creates a lot of internal confusion and it also plays out in the organization that you lead. So that's yeah. when you start getting into um, organizations that do a lot of churn and are in crisis mode all the time when you don't necessarily have to because you've not clearly articulated why you're doing certain things. It's funny you say that because our managing director here at YFM, which is where I work, um, in order for us to feel motivated for 2021, despite the pandemic, she said to us, you need to know your why. Yes, you work for YFM, mm -hmm. but you need to know why you're here. And if you know why you're here, then you'll know why you want to stay, despite how things can be depressing sometimes during the pandemic, despite how hard sometimes work can be. So you've just put perspective into what she was saying, because at first I wasn't understanding her, and what you've now said has helped me understand that. And I hope that those who are watching this webinar are also realizing the same thing now Dyla, i want yeah, to and it's important for me if i can just come yeah. in and it's, it's also yes, important sure. that it's, it's important that you actually really understand why because like you said mm. when when things are tough and the chips are down mm. you actually build in that resilience because you have clarity of thought as to why you are doing certain things and you yeah. become a part of the solution wow Speak of solution, I mean, the CEO position that you now hold as a black woman in South Africa is not your first leadership role. I must then ask you, what lessons and um, experiences have you taken from your previous leadership roles and now moved that and have, have, and they've kind of prepared you for the next role? So the, the challenges that you are now facing, what have you used from your previous leadership roles in order for you to tackle those challenges? I'll probably start by what I, saying, what, by, by what I said earlier on. Yeah. That, um, you know, COVID, there's no blueprint. And uh, my previous experiences have been really more around, you know, process improvement, um, operational excellence, uh, strategy development, just, you know, in a almost business as usual. But even then, even with that, there were key lessons that I've learned in those journeys. Um, I worked for SAB Miller for some years before AB InBev um, took that over. Mm. And uh, I worked on a very difficult project uh, some years back. And the one thing that it actually taught me as well was if you want to craft quick solutions, um, the, you know, be collective in how you do your, uh, do your work. Because if you try to work in isolation, you're not going to get a lot of things done. Mm. The second one for me was um, really the courage to forge ahead. I then worked for another organization that uh, was facing challenges as a result of, you know, some uh, forex, um, um, forex fluctuations. And uh, just getting that courage to forge ahead while and quickly understanding what risks um, you need to manage. So what are the risks and opportunities that you need to manage? And the third one for me was when it's really difficult. There were some difficult times in my career and my leadership journeys where I knew that I couldn't get past it without actually leaning, um, leaning onto other people. And moving here into this role, I mean, I got to lead this role at the cusp of a triple, a triple challenge. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the oil price had just, you know, gotten to near zero. COVID pandemic has just kicked in. And um, we obviously were in an all time low with regards to, you know, the sustainability challenge in uh, the oil industry with the climate change, um, you know, uh, commitments that many uh, companies, countries and uh, organizations have had to uh, make. So having led through different transitions, um, I never imagined that I'd be called up to lead this type of um, scale, but I must say, you know, I've been fortunate enough that the organization that I work for, we have deliberately 
um, made an effort to be a lot more inclusive, but also to accept the diversity of thought as well that people have. So get a chance to listen to everybody and make sure that we build resilience and courage in a lot more people for us to be able to navigate this challenge. And I must say, um, we have survived uh, this past year and much better than we expected to. I love that you mentioned Blueprint um, earlier on in your response to the question. I must then ask you, how has your leadership style changed in the past year, not to mention since becoming a leader? Not much. Okay. You know, I always say, if you show up authentically and you remain yourself, um, you will probably develop because there are certain lessons that you learn. Yeah. But the ethos of who you are actually remains at the core of it. And, you know, not much has changed. And it, yes, one can be tempted to say, I've done this, I've done that, but I'm, I've really maintained who I am as a person and also in terms of leadership styles. Um, the core of who I am has remained. And it's really that of, you know, inclusivity, but also trying to make sure that people understand the concept of a high performance culture, because that is how I have been trained in my work in my work environment, but the ethos of my leadership hasn't really changed. Um, Dayla, it's, it's said that in, in many of the studies that South Africa has done, that many of the millennials are finding themselves right now in a position where they're trying to get to leadership roles or they're trying to change the way that they do their leadership. What benefits do different leadership styles bring to the table? And, and how can this help someone who's trying to become a leader or trying to improve their leadership skills? Okay. I'll address this in two, from two different perspectives. Okay. The first one is from an individual perspective. And uh, the second is from a collective perspective in terms of the different uh, people that you bring into a leadership team. But as an individual, um, one has to realize that it's, you, you, you have to be quite uh, versatile and fluid as a leader because there are times that you're called upon to lead and you must lead and lead from the front. Then there are times that you're called upon to participate and, you know, and you're being led by a subject matter expert. Accept that. You learn, you listen, and you actually not just learn and listen, but you start to... Um, understand exactly how that subject matter expert is influencing, positively influencing the decisions that you need to take. Mm. And when you now need to inspire a vision that may not necessarily be within your subject matter field, you actually do so and you now have the ability to, to lead, even though you're not actually, you don't own that subject, but you yeah. then become, you start owning that vision. And then obviously there are times where you need to be, you need to bring everybody together. So you've got a flock of sheep, you need to bring them together and you need to guide and make sure that, you know, you give that direction because otherwise you run the risk of everybody moving off in a separate direction. So that from an individual perspective is, you know, how I have actually um, experienced my leadership, that it's not been just one style. Values is one thing, but if you still keep your values, you can still change your leadership style depending on the situation. And then the second one for me is, as you're building leadership teams, at different leadership styles um, in a team, actually you know, create what I call musical notes um, within your leadership structure. So you get to start to rely on each other a lot more for the strengths um, and you challenge each other a lot more constructively. So because people are different and people see leadership differently, you actually gain value from diversity in leadership. And by diversity, often people think it's the physical aspects of diversity. But you've got diversity in thought, you have got um, diversity in you know, different forms. I mean, in my team that I've just created, I've mm -hmm. got what I call the thinkers, because I know these are people who actually, from an academic perspective, they're pursuing you know, PhDs, and the way they process information is probably different from somebody else who has come through the ranks and is in a leadership structure by virtue of them being technically sound. And they also bring in a different thought process 
to it. However, the one thing that needs to remain the same in that leadership team is to make sure that the purpose again is uniform and you try and build a uniform culture because that culture is what is going to um, permeate further down into the organization. So I think from that, in terms of the different leadership styles, one piece of advice I can give to people is to learn to adapt and to be dynamic depending on the situation. All right. Someone right now has joined the webinar because they're thinking, I can probably learn a thing or two from Dialo. I want to then know what are the key leadership strategies that we should implement right now in our different leadership roles that will enhance our ability to make the organizations that we work for uh, future proofing them to be successful? Okay. I think the most important one for me, and I'll probably just focus on this one, mm. um, is ethics and value-oriented decision-making. Mm. If this should really become the compass that guides leaders into the future, because I can tell you, I don't think we'll have the type of stability that we've had in the past 30, 40 years going forward. I'm of the view that things are going to be a lot, change is going to be something that is um, a part of us, and we're going to have to live with it in many different ways as we go through um, the transition. And I'll just, you know, if I think about some of the work that I've been doing is, for example, how mobility is going to change in the coming years. I mean, currently we're driving uh, fuel cars, then everyone's speaking, you know, there's hydrogen that comes in as a uh, source of energy, you also have EV and so forth. And we actually don't know what the end state would look like. Mm -hmm. And Think about people who are also in mining they're going through their own transitions the digital world as well is going through their own transitions and in and in going through those transitions key decisions will have to be made but in all of that if you try and play the short game rather than playing the long game you will fall short because you'll make decisions for now but change is likely to happen in the next two to three years and with that happening you may actually have lost the opportunity to be a lot more sustainable. Because if you think about it in the past, it was okay to lead for now and leading for now would possibly also guarantee um, that the, the strategy that you implemented today is going to be relevant in the next two years. But that isn't going to be the case. But yeah. if you put in ethics and, val and values, so I call it value-oriented decision-making, at the core of you know, your leadership strategy, in everything that you do, you'll actually recognize that change is imminent. And with change being, you know, almost what we now call steady state, mm -hmm. um, you will need to make sure that your decision making caters for the change that is coming along the way. Wow. Speak of change, how important is internal management and, and change within the management during these times? Okay. Um, internal change management, <laughs> it's, you know, it's very, we, we shouldn't isolate internal change management without recognizing that we live in a universal environment, right? Mm. But having said that, if I talk about inter internal change management from an organizational perspective, again, I said when I spoke earlier on, employees are your most important asset. Mm. And with organizations and many organizations, in fact, almost all that I probably have interact with in the South African environment and globally have gone through some change of sort of, of some form in the last year or so as, as a result of this um, global pandemic that we've had to navigate. Mm -hmm. um, and internally, managing that, the change in terms of communicating the change. So start change. by communicating the change. And once you've communicated the change, you've actually got to make sure that you give people a reason to understand how we are managing that change so that you avoid a mass, you know, a mass exodus of people because of that anxiety. Why? Mm -hmm. Because you've actually got to give them that purpose. And when they understand the change that we're going through and why we're going through that change, it becomes a lot easier for us to actually manage as we get out of the change. You know, the change has got different um, cycles, so the change uh, cycle as we're going through that curve and getting out of it into the mm -hmm. upward phase, they actually understand 
where we are going as a result. But I think what's more important, which we sometimes lose sight of, is the sustainability aspect. We, we manage the internal change, but forget that we, act, we, we have to continue to make it sustainable because we put in a lot of focus on while the change is happening, but the change happens a lot longer. So, you know, how should we, we should, we should focus our efforts on ensuring that the change management practices that we put into the organization are actually sustainable as we go through different waves of mini changes that, you know, we'll be embarking on. The pandemic has been quite a heavy wave when it comes to change. Um, and the U a UK based study said that 57% of employees are finding themselves almost lost, depressed, and confused about what happens next. So I want to know, Dana, what advice would you give someone right now who's in a leadership position who has a team struggling to win? What advice would you give them in order for them to? go past this uh, stumbling block and in order for them to excel and reach their goals as a team? Most importantly, first things first, be clear on your vision and priorities. There's nothing more frustrating for, for a team or people who are working when there's no sense of direction. Mm. Um, people call up on strategies or on a, on, a, on a vision that was relevant five years ago and is not relevant now. So what happens is then people start to continue to work on that old vision and old ways of working when times have changed and it creates a lot of fatigue in the organization. It creates a you know, lack of a sense of direction and people don't know why they're doing certain things. So as a leader, the best thing you can do for people is to give direction and continuously repeat that message or the direction that you're giving until it becomes a habit because then people start to know that, okay, this is where we are going, this is where we are focused, and we are actually geared towards a particular goal. The second one for me is, as a leader, get, uh, connect with people within the organization of a diverse nature, such that you get them to champion the vision. If you get people to champion the vision and you don't get the same thinkers as people who think alike to champion that vision, you are likely to resonate further down that organization because if I'm sitting and I'm sitting somewhere in a you know, depot somewhere um, and the person that's communicating that vision to me is someone who I can relate to or has the same um, operating style or even language and so forth as me, I'm likely to get why I'm doing certain things, as opposed to just the leader owning it and taking an instructive approach. So how do you bring more people along such that in a large organization, you're able to disseminate that information rather than relying on, you know, in the past, people would go for imbezos, people would have uh, flyers going all over the place, but now you don't have the luxury of that. So how do you actually take that collective effort to make sure that that vision or the priorities that you have for the immediate and into the long term are actually well communicated. Yeah. We have talked about challenges and, and you know, scenario, and you've made scenarios that help one understand how they can become better managers in their leadership positions. But what are some of the lessons that you have learned and how will you use these moving forward? And before answering this, please do also bear in mind there's someone listening who's also probably struggling to take the lessons they learned and move forward with those in the future. So your, your answer could probably help someone also use the same mechanic in dealing with that. Whew, I must say, COVID, I don't think anyone ever prepared for that. Uh, to yeah. me, it's, yeah. It really was a challenge. It, it, it got to us. Um, but remember, as individuals as well, we evolve and situations evolve. And we learn from that. And for me, if I, you know, I can give you examples of different things that have worked. But the one thing that actually came to the fore for me, because I do a lot of reflection, is the concept mm -hmm. of having an agile mindset. Because by having an agile mindset, you, an agile mindset. You, also, you also start moving away from the concept of perfection. Yes, you want to do things right, but you've actually got to do them very quickly. And you run the risk, if you don't do things very quickly, you run the risk of the situation changing drastically 
before you actually implement what you're thinking. Mm. And I've made mistakes. And I, I don't believe that there's anyone who can stand up up front and say, I haven't made mistakes because then that's not being authentic. But practice um, failing fast and moving forward fast mm. because the, the pace of change is much faster than I ever was trained for. And, mm. you know, we just need to, you know, bring out that agile mindset and ensuring that, you know, we know that we will fail at some point or another, but fail fast, learn fast, move forward quickly. And that for me has been the biggest lesson I've learned. And I think it's, it's something that probably as I go to the latter part of my career is, mm. you know, I'll be taking that forward with me. Yeah, you you somewhat highlighting a new normal that we are in, and whether you work in a digital space or a uh, corporate space that's got you know traditional ways, we're finding ourselves in a new normal because of the pandemic. With that said, um, what would you say are the a leader that's currently leading right now or a future leader can better equip themselves for that new normal that we have now had to adjust to? Okay. Um, do me, I might be repeating myself actually, but yes, because I, I, you did I answer slightly the, the one before. So now it's about you know the equipment that I need, the tools that I need to 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 deal with this new normal. Yeah, I think for me, like I'll go back again and maybe just to elaborate. You know, mm. the agile mindset. How we, you know, just how do you make sure that you you accept the change as it, as, it, as it takes place. But also, you know, think global or universal. When I say global, I don't mean global from a physical context, but universal while understanding your local context. I mean, we don't function as an island. And if you, if you think a lot more internally or if you're internally focused, you will lose sight of how the environment is changing outside and equip yourself with the, the tools to be able to navigate both internally and externally. So if you understand how, you know, how the external environment is changing, you are then able to um, put in solutions in place for the actual direct accountability, accountability and responsibilities that you are um, given to do. But also in that process, don't forget to cultivate a high performance mindset. Because if you've got a high performance culture and mindset, even in the face of many challenges, you will always um, focus on high performance. High performance doesn't necessarily mean working hard, mm -hmm. but understand what success looks like, understand what good looks like. And, you know, does it require innovation, innovation in order for you to move with the pace of change, but be very ad adaptable in that, uh, in that setup. I love that. Dalla, as a leader and also um, someone that is a mentor to many, people see you as their inspiration. But who is Dayala Mujabili's, you know, is, who inspires you? Who are the people that you look up to and say, yeah, that person got me going today? <laughs> no, no, no. You know, people always ask things like that. And yeah. I, I actually don't have leaders that I say I want to be like, and I'll explain myself Please. because I, I genuinely believe we're all individuals, but the people that I'm actually in awe of are the men and women that are in challenged situations. I mean, if you think about it, we take a lot for granted. We put a lot of pressure on people to want to be like the person that is most um, visible, most communicated, presumed to be most successful, but they're actually people who wake up every morning and in spite of the challenges that they face, they work very hard for an honest living. They could be out in the villages, they could be out in a, a humble setting, but it takes strength and courage to actually get out there and get an honest living. And I mean, I, you know, while I'm a believer that we shouldn't glorify struggling because that's not what we should be doing, but at the same time, we shouldn't um, get everyone to start thinking that they can be the next Kamala Harris or, you know, <laughs> something of that sort, yeah. but yeah. the best that they can possibly be. And for me, it's inspiring to see people um, actually work hard to get themselves an honest living mm. in a very courageous manner. 
Yeah. So I, I often try not to um, emulate someone else because you can only be who you are. Yeah. You have dropped some really, really good gems. I mean, I, I wasn't able to write any notes, so I'm going to have to go back and listen so I can take down some quotes from you. Um, but before we wrap up the interview with myself and you, um, yesterday I was actually going to an interview for a leadership position within the company. And some of the things you've said now, I'm like, oh, man, I wish I'd had this talk with Dahelo before going into that interview. So there might be someone now watching this webinar and they're about to go into an interview where they want to apply for a leadership position. What words of advice would you give that individual who's about to either be a leader and get promoted or walk into an interview that will lead them into a position of management? Okay, um, and maybe I'm just being simplistic about this, but hmm. in all honesty, be authentic about who you are. When you're authentic about who you are, you'll understand what you need to do to grow and become better at it. Um, because not everybody's going to be the same. And if you try and give somebody tools that say, do this, do this, do that, their personality may not be aligned with that. But when you make a choice to let your true self be seen by being vulnerable and accepting vulnerability, as something that is normal, I always say you gain the freedom to lead mm. and put your best foot forward. Oh, I think I That's think that would put me at ease. <laughs> Diala, thank you so much for this time. I have learned a lot in this 41 minutes that we've been talking. I'm going to hand over back to Laura, who will allow the opportunity for those who've been asking questions online and the webinar to be able to get those uh, questions answered by you. Thank you so much for taking this time to answer my questions. Thank you. Thanks, Dumi. Thanks, Tumi. I appreciate it. And I appreciate all the little uh, plugs you gave for Rising Star there. Thank you. <laughs> uh, wow. So I don't know if you've seen the chat here. Um, it's so crazy. It's so full. They're so busy. And um, so thank you I to never, everybody. Pardon? I never look at the I never look at the chats when I'm talking because they're very distracting. So let's there see. There are. And, and there's some really interesting uh, questions going on. These people, I have to say, these these people in the audience are amazing attendees, really want to win your mentorship session. <laughs> um, there's a few, yeah. there's a few um, BP specific, industry specific questions, but if you don't mind audience, I'm gonna leave those to one side because they're not really about the leadership or specifically um, referring to the whole to the whole audience we have today. Um, but I'm gonna start, if you don't mind, Bello, there's a lot of questions about Female, being a female, being a female in a male-dominated industry. Um, there's Shego Fatso, there's Yonello, there's Tabile. Many of them want to know is, do you feel like as a woman, you've ever been held to a different standard as you progress through your leadership? Absolutely. Know your reality and don't run away from it. As a woman, I really have felt over the years, there's a different standard. And, you know, when I was, a, I, I don't complain anymore, but when I was a lot younger, I just couldn't understand how, um, I think men are generally a lot more confident and they can take your work and run with it in a very confident manner. Um, but that's probably who they are. I also see, I've got two sons, by the way, and I see their confidence just um, flourishing. And because I was raised in an era where you, you don't necessarily um, be as confident as you, you know, as you possibly can be. So obviously, as a result of that, you don't call out any discrepancies and you continue to work a lot harder. Now, the unfortunate part of that is it does bring in a lot of fatigue for women. I've, I know of a lot of women that have actually left corporate as a result of what I call corporate bullying. So I'm often, I call my leadership team, I've got men in my leadership team and I say to them, call me out when my biases are coming out because I have a strong bias towards protecting women. And sometimes it, um, it plays itself out in a not so nice way, but it's just, you know, we are human beings, so certain things will happen. So I have been held to different standard, but I've taken a personal 
journey of making sure that that doesn't happen under my watch. And I call on a lot more women and men to make sure that that also doesn't happen under their watch. So uh, if I can maybe just share very briefly, uh, about three, four years ago, I was going through a personal purpose journey, just trying to find my per personal purpose. And I was reflecting on a lot of things that have happened to me in my career. And the one thing I said I, I came up with was, I have a personal purpose in everything I do, whether it's in corporate or in my personal life, is to make sure that I uplift other women and groom better men. So if you want to work with me and you're a man, I'll teach you how to be a behavioral. <laughs> <laughs> that, that, that's incredible. Um, I can totally identify with what you say about your sons having natural confidence. I have a son and a daughter and the difference between them. My son is outgoing and like bounces and she's, she's very personal and heart led. Maybe that's my personal experience, but um, I can completely identify with what you're saying. Um, I think that just to follow on from what you were saying, um, Yanella has asked, um, and you've sort of referred to this, but what challenges um, have you experienced as a woman leader, but how did you earn the respect of those that challenged you? Okay, so I think in the corporate space, professionalism is very important. So when people challenge your work, I think the most important thing is to let the facts speak. It's very easy to degenerate into emotion. If you practice the skill of moving away from degenerating into emotion and letting the, the facts speak for them, quite firmly so, you start to gain that respect because then you're actually known to be somebody who actually speaks from a position of facts. The minute you bring in an emotional conversation, you run the risk of being dismissed as you know, emotional and so forth. And that actually, you lose your upper hand as a result of that. So let the, let the facts speak for themselves and continue to hone in and just make sure that in everything that you do, the person that's actually accountable for the results that you want, that, that you are working on, recognizes that it's actually you that is knowledgeable of the subject matter that you're actually handling. Own your space. Um, have yeah. you ever, you, ha you clearly have a very authentic voice um, and this has led you and a purpose and a vision and this has guided you through your career. Um, but have you ever struggled with, make, with staying true to that? Has there ever been situations where you felt challenged? This actually links to my next question of, have, of imposter syndrome. And do you have any advice for those struggling with imposter syndrome? So I'm just going to link those two questions together. Um, okay, I got the imposter one. Repeat the first one. Um, have you ever struggled with staying true to your own voice? Yes, I have struggled. Yes, I have struggled. So I'll advise people stay strong. But I must say, there are times when it's very tough. It's very tough. And I, I, you know, I say to people, come into the, into the workplace, be fact-based. But it's sometimes very difficult. I have to, you know, there's that little child that speaks to the back of my mind and speaks to me and says, Tylo, if someone was sitting in front, I, I tend to mentor myself. If someone was sitting in front of you and asking for that help, what would you say? And you say, you know what, get those tears off, dust your shoes and stay strong. So you struggle with that concept because, you know, you're faced with a lot of challenges. And sometimes that fear of failure is so strong that you actually um, attempted to withdraw and run away from something. But you always need to then ask yourself, why are you doing something? And if you're still convinced that the why remains relevant, continue with it. And anybody that comes into your space will struggle to get you off that footing that you're on. And that also speaks to the imposter syndrome because someone can question and you start asking yourself, is this real? Am I, you know, is this happening to me? Am I competent? Uh, can I do this? But if you start telling yourself, stand in front of the mirror, I'm mentoring myself. This is, I know that this is what I'm capable of. This is who I am and do it on a daily basis. I mean, I'm married and my husband sometimes thinks, he says to me, are you normal? Because at night, I don't know if I'm talking to myself. I said, look, 
I'm normal because I don't answer myself. I'm talking to myself. <laughs> Everyone is two way. <laughs> yes. I love it. I love it. But it's all just speaking to you. your authenticity, to your true voice and your true belief and your own ethical campus and your own purpose. And yes. Katerza would like to know, um, when you get overwhelmed, and this, I think this may be what you do, is what you've just referred to, but what do you do to ground yourself when you get overwhelmed? If I'm in my home environment and I can wait till it, I enjoy gardening. I do a lot of gardening. So people who, um, I'm, not, I'm not big on social media, but people who are in my close circle, on my WhatsApp, I post my roses, I grow what we call hybrid tea roses, you know, the big roses that you get in Woolworths and so forth. I grow those. So I spend time in my garden on a Saturday and a, sometimes on a Sunday. Now, because it's COVID, I actually don't go to many places. And that has really been um, very helpful. But in terms of grounding myself um, also in the corporate space is also to speak to other people. You know, humility over the years, and I think I probably got that from my mom, very quite, a hum quite humble in her way of working. And, um, you know, if by speaking to other people, and it doesn't matter at which level they are, you actually start to um, connect with people. And as you speak, you actually realize you're not alone in something. Absolutely, shared experiences. And I think certainly through these webinars, there's some feedback that we've got is that just asking the questions and realizing that leaders such as yourselves have also been through the journey. And um, we've had feedback that this is why they're so relevant and so important and so useful because people can, who are behind you, who are following you, um, can understand that it's not always easy and it is a challenge and they can learn that ways and means and methods of moving forwards. So thank you for that. Um, yeah. Oh, Gladys. Gladys says, so um, it's often said that the first big achievement is just to start. What was the first step you took in your leadership career? What was your start? My start was <laughs> moving away from actually, it's, an, it's a funny story. I won't go into the details of it, but I work for an organization, a very big good organization and uh, I was bullied and because I knew I wanted to do something I was bullied I was bullied verbally I was bullied um, emotionally and I was actually sworn at by the way it happened in those days I decided that day this is it that's it and I left and I left the organization and then I came back after 14 months <laughs> but for me it's the first step of understand what you're capable of and understand what you can handle and tolerate. If it's not within who you are, the first leadership step is, a, is by managing yourself. If you're not able to lead yourself, you're not going to get onto the leadership journey. So start by leading yourself and start by understanding where you want to go. When you do that, it starts to get a lot better because now you're, you're getting to truly lead yourself. Um, because I think as we grow up, we manage ourselves, we, you know, we do what needs to be done, but we don't do self-leadership in a sense. But by doing self-leadership, you then also then start to, start to find it easier to lead people because you start setting your, your boundaries as well. Awesome. Awesome. And just come up as a question there, which I was just trying to make note of from Kaketsa, who I know is one of our former rising stars. So thank you for joining us, Kaketsa. Mm -hmm. um, what does responsible leadership mean to you and how have you modeled that throughout your career and for those that you lead? Okay, so if you recall earlier on, I spoke about ethical and uh, value-based um, decision-making. So responsible leadership is you are tasked with leading people, you are tasked with leading an organization, and you are tasked with leading activities. In what you do, do you actually ensure that you put people, people's safety, and, and by safety, I'm not talking about physical safety alone, there's psychological safety, there's emotional safety. You also put that at the front of their minds, but also being honest with them when they don't um, perform or don't meet deadlines, but by them not meeting deadlines doesn't mean you're threatening somebody out of a job. You are actually getting into a space where you're coaching them and mentoring them to be better 
So you're giving them a sense of security within the organization, knowing that they can actually make mistakes and develop and grow while in those roles because we're all not perfect. And when you're also tasked with leading activities to ensure that the activities that you're leading, you continue to lead them in an ethical manner and don't breach boundaries that you're not supposed to. Again and again and again, I just hear authenticity, your voice, your truth. Um, I think it's incredible. <laughs> and I'm certainly very inspired. Um, there was a question. Um, how would you maintain your voice if you're a young professional in a boardroom full of decades of experience? Um, how, what's the best way, it's from McCladsey, what's the best way to participate and be heard, but without seeing as the, being seen as a pushy youngster? Again, you know when you're a young person, I'll, I'll give you an example. I sat in a boardroom before I turned 30, and um, I was very nervous because I was the only woman, and more importantly, I was the only black woman in that room. And this was, what, 2006, I think, yeah? And um, it was very nerve wracking. But what I learned from that is um, know your content. If you know your content, when you speak, you naturally start to develop a level of confidence because you have, you've got a relationship with your content. And when you've developed that, a lot of other things are a learning journey. And find, find a, a, one or two people within that group that you are able to become vulnerable with to get them to understand that you're on a learning journey. I think the biggest mistake that a lot of people make and young people put a lot of pressure on themselves is to believe that they can be at the same level as, or, uh, uh, at the same experience level as somebody who's been in that space for 30 odd years. The reality is you're still growing and accept that. But sometimes it's very difficult to let everyone know that because it does come across as Ooh, probably I don't know what I'm supposed to do. But if you find one or two people who can, should I call it, sponsor or mentor you within that group of people who you know will have your back when you're feeling nervous, when you're feeling uncomfortable. That for me is what I think would be a good strategy. That's, and it worked for me. That's, that's incredible. It's like reach out and make connections outside of the boardroom first without just walking in as a youngster and knowing it all um but also I've, in previous webinars i've also heard people say ask for help volunteer your services make yourself useful and then and then these experienced people and leaders in the room will notice you it's it's about it's not about it's not about pushing yourself forward but it's about making yourself be seen i think that's just yeah. absolutely um and linking on to this, Sam Tanda says, how, what can a young professional do to ensure they are always on top of their game at work? <laughs> Sorry, I think work you can't hard. be. That's not fair. <laughs> you can't be on top of your game every day. It's, a, it's true. And I know it's very, it's, people think it's not the right thing to say. You can be on top of your game most days because that is generally who you are. You are on top of your game and you understand what needs to happen. But there are days where things, you're not going to be on top of your game. Again, don't sit um, in isolation. Communicate that. Feel free. Create those safety nets or get people, align with people that you believe you can actually speak to, to say, you know what, I'm actually not okay. And maybe if I were to give a practical example, when I had my second um, son, he was born prematurely and, um, you know, I wasn't in a very good space, but I had to go back to work. And I just went to my boss and I said to him, I'm not okay. It's what it is. And I was pleasantly surprised. He literally said to me, look, I understand where you've been and uh, what you're probably going through. And my activity sets were reduced um, for at least, I think it was almost a year. And then he said, because I know you're capable, you know, when you're ready, um, of which don't abuse it. Because I mean, I'm, I said to myself, I'm not going to abuse this um, ticket I've been given but I'm going to make sure that indeed when I'm ready and able to put up my hand and start increasing my workload. So it's, it's a two-way street. You're not going to be always on top of your game. It is life, we are human beings. 
but you've earned in your situation you earned the respect to be trusted that it isn't a situation you would abuse um because they knew yes. they knew that top of your game is your norm <laughs> um, yes, but did that, exactly. did, that inspire, did that inspire your loyalty to the organization did that make you come back and do even more it did because you know as as human beings it's not always about you know the money are you paid well or so forth if you're made to feel valued in an organization you'll give your all you will and that that for me it was uh, it, it really made me feel valued in the organization until it was brought over uh, <laughs> changed <laughs> yeah <laughs> I'm going to flip a little bit now because there's quite a few questions um, coming up about work-life balance and um, sugar again. I appreciate that actually there's two sugar fatsos in the um, questions. Both of you are very active, but it makes you look like one of you is really, really active when I just pick up your name. <laughs> but thank you for being so active with really good questions. Um, but how do you, uh, Taylor, how do you... Um, boundaries have become blurred over the past year, over the past 18 months, uh, working from home, like that work-life balance, blurred boundaries. How, do you, how have you managed it and what advice would you have for those that are struggling? Um, I think it remains the same within COVID. We, uh, in, you know, we are in COVID and before COVID. I did a previous Rising Star um, um, talk, I think it was 2019, so that was before COVID. And um, the one thing I said to people is, you know, we talk about work-life balance, but I see it as work-life integration. So for every organization I've worked for, I've brought my family along. So my family knows what's happening, you know, how it's happening, how things are taking place. And in the workplace, they know about my family. I create jokes and even when I've had a bad morning, I said, you won't believe what happened to me today. And just because this is who I am, so I believe more in work-life integration. And yes, there are boundaries to it. Um, but at the same time, communicate your boundaries and be clear on what you believe is, is work that you can handle and what you cannot handle. Because if you do not handle, if you do not communicate that very clearly, it becomes a bit of a challenge. So again, what we learn in university, and we also we also do some modules around communication, making sure you communicate, have your communication skills right from high school into university. That remains relevant. If you never communicate, you are likely to be, you're like people are not likely to know what your boundaries are. It's very, I mean, we all get into the workplace and we say, okay, it's an eight to five job, but then when people don't know where your boundaries are set, you then struggle with that work-life balance because you are not communicating what is possible and what's not possible. It's very important. Absolutely. And this is just a question I've got from my learnings in doing these. Um, there's some research that says, well, much research actually, it says during COVID, women have taken on so much more of the roles and responsibilities of the housework, whilst of the housework of the children, of the family, while still trying to pursue their career. Have you found this and how have you managed this? I haven't found it because I speak up. I speak up. To be honest with you, I, my children know. I've taught my children to be independent. I've taught my husband, and, I, and I'm serious when I say I've taught my husband the concept of shared, shared tasks because the reality is a lot of our male counterparts are not raised to understand those shared tasks, although, I mean, we are raising ours that way, so... Yes. I'd, be, I'd be damned if my son were to say, were to tell anybody that he doesn't do work because he knows he does. <laughs> so everybody does their fair bit. And not everybody does their fair bit. During COVID, I would wake up and, you know, I'd be working from about seven in the morning till very late, particularly when, it, when we're in the crux of it and volumes are not coming yeah. for organization and so forth. But it's very important that everybody knows that they have a role to play and you don't burden yourself. So I don't believe in the concept of a woman struggling to the point where, you know, it was Mother's Day and people were, you know, people would post content such as a woman struggles and so forth. And I said, don't do that to yourself. It's not worth it because 
you're going to break down while everyone else is leaning onto you. It's not worth it. I personally find that incredibly inspiring. And for my, I'm a single mom of two small children, and I run the business. And I have, I have, I have help. I've got a very fortunate, fortunate situation that I can have help. And then just to hear you saying that that's okay, um, it's very inspiring. <laughs> so thank you for that personally. Um, okay, I'm going to jump over again um, because we're going to wind up soon. So we're going to move on to the theme of. Um, paying it forward, inspiring those in the audience and helping them on their journeys. So very simple question. Do you read a lot and what would you recommend? <laughs> oh, I pick up anything and I read. <laughs> <laughs> no, seriously, I, I read technical books. I read um, leadership books. I would read stories. Um, I used to read a lot of fiction, but uh, not anymore. Um, the, so, for example, I mean, if I talk about um, personal books, there's a book, a book by Maya Angelou, Letter to My Daughter, that was a good one that I read, and a local book that I found mesmerizing. And I, I'll tell you, I actually literally said, I am going to, you know, ask to have her as my mentor, and she accepted. So Nolita Fagude, who is currently with the Anglo, okay. I read her book, Boardroom Dancing. And I thought, wow, but this woman is alive and she's in South Africa. I want to know her. <laughs> and I, you know, plucked up the courage after a couple of months. And she was very receptive. She's a very lovely lady. And we've built a relationship since. Um, and from nowhere, and you'd be surprised that there are people, you think you cannot reach out to certain people, but you can. And they will give you that space. And... Uh, you know, she's somebody that I now see as, an, as an, an older sister, in a sense. And um, also there's a book that I was reading called The Multipliers, uh, which is something that I'm quite um, keen on, that says, you know, how do you actually make sure that you multiply more of you and you don't just do things for your own benefit, but you bring other people along and you give them recognition and so forth. And that actually resonated, you know, quite well with me. Wow, you managed to answer like two more questions just in your book, in your book reading. One question is how do you find a mentor? How do you approach a mentor? How do you identify a mentor? And no, no, no. You that's not exactly it. how that's not exactly how I do it. <laughs> and can you ex expand just a little bit on mentorship? Yeah, so I think on mentorship, um, in reality, you actually need to identify why you want to be mentored. So if the mentorship is um, based on corporate performance, you'd want to get an internal mentor. If you've got a passion for a certain topic in society and there's somebody that's actually very good at it out there, um, you know, reach out externally, ask people, can someone help here and there and get them to, um, you know, get them to reach out to the next person to say, look, I actually know somebody, would you be in a position to mentor them? And sometimes it's not easy. It's not like you've got mentors waiting in a pool. Right. But for me, the most important is you have a meeting of minds because there's nothing more frustrating as mentoring somebody who doesn't have the same values as you or you having a mentor with as some, having a mentor who actually doesn't have the same values of you. So when that person is speaking, you don't resonate. And I've, I mean, in the journey of finding different mentors, I've been through that space where... I've got a mentor speaking and the mentor is telling me to be aggressive, to be this, to be that. And I'm like, but it's going to take so much more energy from me. I'm going to be frustrated. It's not who I am. And I think we agreed it's not going to work. So be, find somebody who actually resonates to, with your values as well. So it's, it's about finding common ground, both in theme and strategy and subject matter, as well as um, in values and authenticity. So... And if that works, then maybe there'll be a very long and um, positive path ahead. Um, but the second question, going back to your book and also the, bringing in the chat, um, how do you uplift those that follow you? What are, uh, what are the, any programs or procedures you put in place to pave the way for those that follow? The young people in the audience would love to know. You've mentioned how you support women. That's a really big thing for you. But... What, what, what can you do? What have you done to make it easier for those that follow? 
Um, okay. Like I said, I'm not, when you say follow me, I'm not big on social media. And uh, you know, my son was saying to me, Mom, you've got to get this going. You, you're not, <laughs> and I mean, he's, he's going on 17, so he understands all of this. And I'm like, boy, I don't have time for all of this. It's just a lot of, it's just busy. But, you know, the way I've often done it is I, because I have a passion for lecturing and, um, you know, engaging with the youth, I actually get into a classroom. So I've been doing sessional lecturing at uh, VITS um, for the past couple of years. Uh, but obviously now with COVID, you're virtual. We, we all, we're all trying to learn this, and I'm not exactly an expert at this virtual world, but I think I'm getting better. So I reach out to them and engage with them in those kind of settings. Um, and I do recognize that I probably need to be on social media a lot more, but I also need to manage. I need to do it in a manner that I can manage. I am on LinkedIn, um, not super active, but I, I would like to get more. So I'm also going to start. I've made a commitment that, you know, I need to do a lot more of that. But in terms of engaging with them, I actually engage more in academic settings because I always say, I think I'm an academic at heart. But we'll see as that goes on. Oh, look at all your <laughs> <laughs> but that's amazing. You actually got into the lecture room, you got into the classroom and you share your experiences there as you are today. So, I mean, I think that's, I think that's clear that you have a give back and a heart and a soul to uplift those that follow you. Um, I feel like we've been talking forever, but like in a really good way, in a really positive, not talking forever that's drawn out. <laughs> um, <but> I'm gonna, <laughs> I've really enjoyed this session. Thank you. Um, I'm yes. just going to ask two more questions. Um, Ampo mm -hmm. uh, would like to know, what mantra do you live by? And I think that just sums up everything we've discussed so far. The art of the impossible. I've always said it. I think I've said this for the last 15 years, the art of the impossible. Um, I'm probably on the back end of a generation of people that had to um, struggle. And I say back end because I think the earlier, slightly earlier generation probably had a lot more struggle. But, um, you know, I, I always say to myself, I want to do what is deemed not possible. Obviously within my limits, because I then have to recognize that I'm only human and there's only so much I can possibly do <laughs> the art of the impossible and when people I mean it's, it's happened to me in many in, my, in many of my roles in in the workplace people would say no but this has never happened and we're not going to do it and I say well but in my mind it makes sense so we're going to do it and we're going to try it and it happens and we move forward like oh we never thought so for me it's the art of the impossible and it continues I, th I think that makes you an incredible leader and it's also the bravery to put, to progress with something that people may question. <laughs> yeah. Okay, last up, last up advice, what, what nuggets, what piece of advice can you leave, leave for these young leaders who've given their time to attend today, learn from you? What, can you, what piece of advice would you leave them with? Or what would you say to yourself 20 years ago? What would I say to, to, to myself 20 years ago? You're not perfect, be authentic, but fight for your space. And by that, I mean, you know, we don't, you know, don't try and get somebody to be who they're not, but at the same time, if they know their worth, they will fight for their space and fight for what they're worth without compromise. Amazing. Um, yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much for your time. And um, we will send you through the chat. It's amazing. Um, you've definitely inspired our whole, well, our whole generation is probably a bit excessive for the attendance in the audience. But, um, but you've definitely There's a lot in the chat. I'm, I'm now going through the chat and it's, oh, there's just a lot, but I don't think we'll be able to answer it all. But uh, yeah. Um, yeah, no, I think, we, I think we're winding up. There is, but there's some really active chats and real engaged, real, um, really engaged session. So that speaks to you, it speaks to them, it speaks to the whole format. So thank you, everybody. Um, I'm just gonna, I made a couple of notes while uh, Tumi was um, interviewing you and the things that I picked up from, from your presentation. Um, be authentic, um, be authentic over and above anything else. Fail fast and move forward, have an agile mindset. Focus on people, focusing on people is important. Know your why, we spent a lot of time on knowing your why. 
Um, but if you know the why, the how will take care of itself. That came from the chat, so as a follow up to, what, to knowing your why. Um, be clear on your vision, and in, but ensure your vision is relevant. Um, uh, and in response to that, Vino says, I've never come across such a grounded, humble, and superwoman. So there you go. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, and the last one, you gain the freedom to lead. So they're the nuggets that I took out while I had the time to make notes. Um, I appreciate them. I'm sure the audience appreciate them. Um, and thank you. Thank you so much for your time, Dalo. Thank you, Laura. It's been uh, good chatting. And uh, unfortunately, we're not in an open room because I think, you know, we'd have a lot more conversation in an open room but it's the new world isn't it it is and let's hope let's hope soon let's hope we can do a follow-up soon and do it in a room i'm still very much hoping that i can do my grad star awards in september um it's recognizing the top one sitting behind me recognizing the top 100 grad stars so it's not an enormous event but grad stars if you've entered the grad star awards i'm still planning on doing your events in september i'm hoping the world will allow us to do it this year so we can all be together, we can all share our energies, and we can all learn from each other. But I'm going to flag myself here. If you don't enter the Grad Star Awards, you're hardly going to be there, are you? So please do that. You've got to the end of the month. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Why not? Okay. <laughs> so to you look my phone up so much, I thought I'd give it a chance. Um, <laughs> but thank you. Um, we're completely honoured. Um, and thank you again for your um, offer to give the 60 minute mentorship. We'll, uh, we'll be in touch with you. And then we will advise that amazing person in the audience. So wow, Absolutely. what a way to start a Friday. Happy Friday, everyone, and take care. Take care, bye. Bye.